For those of you who have been on my channel for a while, you know that I graduated law school, but I have been all but brought to financial ruin due to the fact that I graduated law school and I was overqualified for basic jobs, but I was underqualified for legal jobs. So I was basically treated like a convicted felon. I have done everything in my power to try to change these policies. The bar exam does not measure competency. The bar exam was an instrument of racism and it was designed to keep blacks, Jews, and immigrants out of the practice of law. I've researched this issue thoroughly. I had a lot of data supporting this. Um, like I said, I've run for office trying to promote this issue. I filed lawsuits. Um, I've been interviewed by the media. I've done everything in my power to try to curtail this tool of oppression. And, you know, as my last ditch effort to try to, you know, connect with someone who was a celebrity and someone who has political relevance, I went to Judge Joe Brown maybe three or four years ago seeking his support on this issue, right? And I was largely gaslit and told that Black law students just don't know how to write. So um, I'm going to play this clip and then I'm going to show, I'm going to show y'all some receipts that everything that I said was absolutely right. And now the ties are starting to change and people are starting to recognize that the bar exam doesn't measure competency and that it was designed to keep blacks and minorities out of the practice of law. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I, I would like to know if you'd be willing to discuss the racism behind the American Bar Association and the law licensing schemes, which have been used to systematically keep out people of color. There's not any law that keeps anybody systematically out of the bar is that they are still using these practices. They are systematically using it. The, these bar exams, um, uh, there's psychometric tests that are supposed to be used on uh, standardized tests. And bar exams do not meet the indicia. I mean, they, they, uh, they don't meet the qualifications for content validity and criterion reliability. And people of color disproportionately fail the bar exam and they're kept out of the practice of law. And well, these people are unheard of. They just don't... Let me say this again. Having been involved with this for 50 years and looked at bar exams and seen answers to them, the main problem I've noticed with black applicants is they don't know how to write properly. This is so discouraging. I mean, you would think that you would get support from members of the black community, but Absolutely not. I would get more support from the dominant society. And it was actually the dominant society who actually recognized this disparity disparity, um, and that the bar exam was not measuring competency. So it has absolutely nothing to do with being able to write properly. The bar exam itself was designed specifically to keep people of color out of the practice of law. And if it's not a valid measurement of skills that are used in the practice of law, if it's not based on content validity and criteria reliability, excuse me, then it is not a valid exam. You can't say this because it's an exam that's somewhat related to the practice of law that um, ipso facto, if you fail, then you don't deserve the practice of law. No. Um, I'm going to go through the history of this, right? But first, I'm going to start out by uh, discussing what actually happened, because now the states are starting to recognize everything that I've been saying before. I can't say that it was necessarily me. It wasn't just me. There, um, there, were, there were organizations out there that were trying to bring awareness to this issue. And I think because of COVID, they were basically forced to recognize, hey, we are... Um, there's a shortage of attorneys. There, there are people who have been kept out of the practice of law. Um, and so, well, now this is an opportunity to re-examine these practices. And I knew it was, it was going to be COVID. I thought, I was hoping that if, um, because basically during, during COVID, they they changed their um, admissions requirements. They, they were giving people uh, provisional licenses because they didn't, want people crammed in a room. So they were giving people uh, provisional licenses and then they would have to take the bar exam later. But then they revisited 
the whole history of bar exam and they recognize that bar exams don't actually measure competency and these are people who are perfectly fit to practice law and they have been unjustly kept out of the practice of law so let's read this article okay washington state supreme court passing the bar no longer required to be a lawyer you know this is washington but the same thing has already uh transpired in oregon Passing a bar exam will no longer be a requirement for becoming a lawyer in Washington, the state Supreme Court ruled in a pair of orders Friday. I told y'all about these orders, right? These courts issue judicial orders, which have the same effect as law. Really, um, this shouldn't be coming from the Supreme Court. This should be coming from the legislature. But state Supreme Courts have said that they have inherent authority to regulate the practice of law. So there's no public oversight. This is an issue that should have been addressed a long time ago, but because the bar associations have a death grip over the practice of law, they weren't willing to relinquish. Basically, COVID tied their hands. They basically, there was a dire need for legal services, and there still are dire need for legal services in many rural areas. Um, the state Supreme Court appointed a bar licensure tax force, tax force to study alternative ways to show competency in 2020 after COVID-19 related modifications resulting in many questioning the efficacy of the current exam. And I'm going to be um, reviewing that, not the entire thing, but just a part of it. During a September presentation before the Washington State Bar Association, Board of Governors Washington Supreme Court Justice Raquel Montoya Lewis, one of the chairs of the Bar Licensure Task Force, said the movement comes in part from law students who have raised the issue about equality, not just in the history of the adoption of the bar exam, but also over the course of many decades. When you look at the disproportionate impacts that the bar exam has on examinees of color. She went on to note, they tend to fail the bar exam in disproportionate numbers. The Bar Licensure Task Force found the traditional bar exam disproportionately and unnecessarily blocks marginalized groups from entering the practice of law and is at best minimally effective for assuring competent lawyers. I've said this, all occupational licenses are designed to eliminate competition. That was the purpose. Um, and I'm going to be discussing this in greater detail when I review this article. Um, as an alternative to the bar exam, law school graduates can earn the right to practice in a number of ways, including completing a six-month apprenticeship while being supervised and guided by a qualified attorney and complete three state-approved or completing, that's a grammatical error, standardized education words, materials and tests under the guidance of a mentoring lawyer in addition to 500 I was at work as a legal intern. For those of you who are not going to um, listen to this entire thing, I'm just going to give you a quick um, overview of what I'm going to be saying. That basically, um, back in the day, Abraham Lincoln was able to attain a law license. No, there were no law licenses, right? There were local bars, and you would be admitted to a local bar. There were no statewide licenses. But um, most, I mean, attorneys basically were merchants who practice law as a side gig. It wasn't profitable enough to be a full-time job. And um, then they started increasing the standards of competency. Um, originally, they um, because they felt that it was exclusive to white men, that um, only white men had access to these apprenticeships. Um, that was the original route, was through apprenticeships. You would study under someone, another attorney, and then you would be admitted to the bar after a 10-minute or over examination, then they created um, law schools, right? So that you would have an alternative to the apprenticeships because the apprenticeships were exclusive to white men in, in many cases. So law schools were supposed to be open to everyone. And then um, there were no bar exams. If you graduated from an, from an approved law school, um, you would have a diploma privilege where you would be admitted to the bar without having to take an exam but then they saw that too many blacks were becoming attorneys so they decided to um create a bar exam to systematically keep blacks out of the practice of law and i have receipts so i'm not making this up so that's that's the cliff notes and then i'm going to go in greater detail about this 
with these alternative pathways, we recognize there are multiple ways to ensure a competent licensed body of new new attorneys who are so desperately needed around the state. Montanya Lewis said in a post-decision news release from Washington Courts, these challenges in addition to Washington adopting a new national conference of bar examiners, next-gen bar exam, which focuses on practice and real-world skills. That exam will be implemented in summer 2026. The court also lowered the bar exam minimum passing score from 2000, I mean, from 270 to 266, a recent reduction previously made during a pandemic. Again, it's unfortunate that it took COVID for them to come to this realization. They, um, they were unwilling to consider this evidence when I presented it in court. Um, it, it, yeah, they, they just didn't care. It's like, well, basically suck it up. You fell, get over it. Um, we're not going to do anything to help you. Just keep taking the bar exam as many times as as necessary. In my state, you can only take it five times. It's extremely expensive. You can't work while you're taking it. It's um, you you get depressed because everyone's making all these comments. It you can't get a job. It completely ruins your life. It brings you to financial ruin. But um, there's so there's tens of thousands of minority law graduates who have not obtained a license. And they're just forgotten. They're just stepped over like roadkill. You, I can't even put my law degree on my resume because nobody will hire me. So I'm relegated to basic jobs. So anyway, let's go to um, what this article said. So this is the task force article. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but Washington State Bar Licensure Task Force, a proposal for the future of Washington State Bar admissions updated following the public content. So this was the uh, report that the state Supreme Court used to um, adopt new rules. But again, this isn't um, new information. This There was a, a study by a 2009 task force from the American Bar, Associ- American Bar Association, which showed that bar exams do not measure fundamental lawyering skills such as oral advocacy, um, tr- uh, factual investigation, um, research. It, it it didn't matter. It, it it had absolutely nothing to do with the practice of law. So this isn't new. This information was available at the time that I presented my lawsuit, and they did they didn't care. But again, it took COVID for them to wake up. So here's what the executive summary says: the best available data indicates that the bar exam disproportionately and unnecessarily blocks historically marginalized groups from entering the practice of law. In addition to the racism and classism written into itself, the time and financial costs of the test reinforce historical inequities in our profession. By the way, the um, classism is that the, is that um, the cost of taking a bar exam itself basically has a disparate impact on on the poor because it's so expensive. You have to take time off work to study for the bar exam. I mean, it's so arduous that you, you I mean, most people don't work while they're taking the bar exam, but the study materials is going to cost you anywhere from three to six thousand dollars. If you have to hire a tutor, that could be 10. There have been people who have taken out mortgages on their home, people who have gone into debt, people who have been abjectly brought to financial ruin because of the bar exam. And people think that it's just some, te- it's not just some test. This is the most arbitrary opinion-based exam in America, which um, disproportionately impacts people of color, but it also impacts the poor, immigrants. And it was designed also to, to keep um, Jews out of the practice of law, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Despite these issues, data indicates the bar exam is best minimally effective for ensuring competent lawyers. Among the deficiencies and common complaints about the bar exam is that it bears little resemblance to the actual practice 
and tends to simply restate the same results already provided by law schools. This is what I said to Judge Joe Brown, and he wanted to argue with me. I told him that there is no courtroom in America that requires you to take 200 multiple choice questions under time conditions that it has absolutely nothing to do with the practice of law. He was extremely dismissive, and he just wanted to lecture me. I came to him for help, and he turned me away because he got his. He was successful in his career, and who cares? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which is what I was trying to do, but the state was keeping its foot on my neck. The state brought me to financial ruin, and it's bringing countless Black law graduates to financial ruin. For these reasons and others, the WBLTF proposes cr creating additional exper experimental pathways to bar licensure that protect the public by improving lawyer skills while reducing the unproductive barriers for historically marginalized groups to enter the profession. This proposal would have a substantial positive impact on the profession using the existing infrastructure in law schools and WSBA which is the Washington State Bar Association. Um, and then they get into their recommendations, but um, this is starting to be a trend. It gets into the little, a little bit about the history. Um, basically, the first bar exam coincided with, what it, what, there's a footnote here. There's a footnote, let me read it. So I don't, I don't wanna misstate what they said. The creation of the bar exam coincided with the first Civil Rights Act of 1875 after three black lawyers were unintentionally granted membership in the ABA in 1914. Their membership was revoked and a meeting was convened to discuss keeping the profession pure. Um, there's a lot of literature from the ABA, extremely racist. They openly refer to black people as the N-word. They said that there were certain races that were naturally endowed with ethics and that they had to create these ethical standards for Blacks, Jews, and immigrants. Um, they routinely refer to Jews as ambulance chasers. And um, I've read so much literature on this. Um, I only have one article that I'm going to, because I, I don't have time to get through all of it. But um, I mean... When I bring this up, people just say, oh, well, that was the ABA. That has nothing to do with state bar association. No, the state bar associations were lobbied for by the American Bar Association. During the Great Depression, while everyone was distracted with the uh, failing economy, the American Bar Association lobbied from state to state in order to create these policies. And order to keep blacks, Jews, and immigrants out of the practice law. I'm not making this up. I have receipts, but I want to um, get through the states that are starting to revisit this issue. Um, since 2005, nine states, including Washington, have appointed committees that are exploring whether to reform their attorney licensing program, and if so, whether to include a pathway in addition to bar exam for licensure. Committees in nine states have proposed or recommended at least one pathway to licensure. In addition to the bar exam, several other states, Colorado, Delaware, and other, and New York, and are in the early stages of exploring licensure reform. Oregon is further along. In 2022, the Oregon Supreme Court approved in concept two examination models in addition to the uniform bar exam a supervised model and an experimental model. Um, following a hearing on the rules in 2023, the court unanimously approved and approved them in November 2023. Oregon's Board of Bar Examiners will implement the supervised practice pathway by May 2024. So they are already starting to do this. Um, these, this is going to become a trend. Bar exams are about to become a thing of the past because they don't actually measure uh, competency and there is a need for attorneys. People of color don't have access to these attorneys. Um, the whole purpose of it was to eliminate competition because white attorneys did not want to have to compete against people of color. And the, the reasons 
that they created in the first place or the reason that they are in place now, they don't want competition. This has absolutely nothing to do with competency. So now I'm going to give y'all some receipts because I know people think I'm making this up. But yeah, so by, basically they're going to start creating alternatives to the bar exam. There's going to be apprenticeships. There's going to be additional course courses that you can take. Um, yeah, it's not going to be um, a life-destroying barrier to entry. Some people aren't good test takers. And even if you are an attorney, I mean, you know, in Britain, there's a there's a different model they use. There's a license. You can be a barrister or a solicitor. But um, in America, we just have one bar exam. No. Maybe you think that I'm not good at oral advocacy, but I can still write documents, right? Why can't I be? I forget which one is which. The barrister. No, the barrister, I believe, is the one who presents arguments in court. And then, a, no, the solicitor. Anyway, barrister, solicitor. Um, America, we only have one license. All right, so now let's get into this because people think that I'm making this shit up. This is an article, and this is one of the many articles that I read. Um, during the time that I filed my lawsuit, I researched so many articles, I can't even remember the names of all of them, but there's so much data. It's replete with proof that the bar exam was designed to keep Blacks out of the practice of law, but this also exists in other professions, medical professions. Um, it's all, it's mere, it can, excuse me, mere economic protectionism. Okay, so let's go this through this. And I, I kind of gave y'all an overview of this um, before, but now we're going to get into nitty gritty because some people think that I'm making this stuff up. So during the Jackson, Jacksonian period of the 1820s and 1830s, the U.S. public re reached a similar conclusion. And that's, I, did, I, I guess I highlighted. Let me, let me just start from the beginning. This paper will show that because the ABA accreditation system is an elitist system that needlessly and unfairly discriminates against minorities and the poor, it should be eliminated. This observation is, entire, is not entirely new. By the way, this article was from 2000, what was the date of this? 2003. So this was way before um the Supreme. So this this data has been around for a long time. I'm I'm not sure why they they're acting like this is new. Um, during the Jacksonian period of the 1820s and 1830s, the U.S. public reached a similar conclusion. It began to recognize that both the then existing bar exams and the various educational requirements for admission to the bar, including the law school attendance in some states, created an upper class profession that unfairly denied entry to all except the wealthy and well connected. In response, the barriers to becoming an, a, law a lawyer be became tumbling down. By 1840, almost any white male could practice law with little or no educational requirements and a perfunctory easily passed the bar. Abraham Lincoln passed a, excuse me, Abraham Lincoln became a lawyer without attending college or law school, and he was required to pass only a 10-minute bar exam. That's what I was trying to tell y'all. They they were self-taught. They just basically studied the law. Um, a lot of them took apprenticeships. Um, there were no state law licenses. You went before a local, they were local. You would go before the local court, and the local court would just asked you some basic questions, right? But they created these complicated doctrines, these legal ease that nobody can understand except the elite. Not only does it does a disservice to those who want to practice law, but it also does a disservice to the public because you don't know the law. Why is this stuff so complicated? The law should be written in plain English. And if a law graduate can't understand the law, then what does that say about the public? This is a, a due process issue. This is an issue when it comes to transparency and so-called democracy. Law should not be written in secret codes and legal ease. They should be easily accessible to anyone. All right. The doors of the profession remain open until the Great Depression. That's why I told y'all, right? During the Great Depression, the ABA lobby from state to state to get these laws passed. In 1920, no state required an applicant to the bar to have attended law school. 
In all states, a person could become a licensed attorney by clerking in a law firm and then passing the easy bar exam. They're calling it a license, but it wasn't an actual, it wasn't a state license. They were admitted to a local bar. Um, you basically would just put it on a list. If one chose to go to law school, admission was not selective. Until 1928, anyone could pay the tuition, excuse me, until 1928, anyone who could pay the tuition could study at any law school, including Harvard and Yale. Um, yeah, th these um, law schools were created as alternatives to apprenticeships, but the apprenticeships were the preferred method. Um, this, this was supposed to make practicing law more accessible to everyone else. Attendance at law school had few academic prerequisites. Only six states require any education beyond high school. 32 states did not even require graduation from high school, right? This is when laws were written in plain English. You didn't need to have a law degree. People were acting like um, the sun is going to fall from the sky if people don't pass a damn bar exam. Of course, the freedom to enter the legal profession never extended fully to blacks. During a period when the profession was wide open to whites, overt discrimination caused the profession to include almost no blacks. In 1910, the U.S. had only 795 black lawyers. This was only 0.7% of the profession, although blacks were 11.1% of the population. In 1914, the ABA accidentally admitted its first three blacks recognizing its mistake it rescinded their admission stating that the settled practice of the association had been to elect only white men to membership the aba formally excluded blacks until 1943 many states prohibited blacks from attending state-run schools although these ch cheaper State subsidized schools were the only schools that most blacks could have afforded. No law school south of Washington, D.C. was racially integrated until 1935. Only in 1964 could the Association of American Law Schools certify that none of its members' schools deny admission to blacks on the grounds of race. In response to the disc discrimination, 10 private law schools for blacks opened during the second half of the 19th century. All but three were quickly closed. During the 1920s and the 1930s, the organized bar began to be harmed economically by competition from an influx of new lawyers, many of whom were minorities. Two new routes to the legal profession had begun to open for Blacks and other minorities. First, Black applicants had begun to sue to be admitted to the state-run law schools that excluded them. In a series of rulings, the U.S. Supreme Court held that state-run schools could not completely exclude Blacks. Rather than integrate their existing schools, three states eventually established purport purportedly separate but equal law schools for Blacks. North Carolina Central University in 1939, Texas Southern University in 1947, and Southern University in Louisiana in 1947, other states began to integrate their law schools. Both the new state schools and the newly integrated older schools offered new opportunities for Blacks. The second new route to the legal profession was the large number of for-profit part-time night law schools that began opening around the 1900s. These schools with cheap tuition earned their undemanding admissions requirements and lower academic standards had been profoundly primarily to serve economic, excuse me, ethnic minorities, excuse me, I need to enlarge that because um, I can't, who viewed the legal profession as a means of social advancement. Thousands of new lawyers had begun to enter the profession by this route. Despite oppressive racial, racial discrimination in law schools and the legal profession, the number of African-American lawyers had doubled between 1900 and 1940, both in absolute numbers and as a proportion to the profession, although the number of Black attorneys was still small. Expressing both bigotry and their economic self-interest in eliminating competition from new lawyers, the bar acted to stop the influx of new minority lawyers in two ways 
that did not involve the overt discrimination that was becoming increasingly difficult. Decreasing bar exam pass rates and tightening law school accreditation. It was no coincidence that the bar exam rates plummeted and mandatory accreditation began exactly at the time when minorities were, fina were finally overcoming overt discrimination and becoming lawyers. The bar exam and accreditations were the ABA's new line of defense against minorities that the ABA erected after overt discrimination began to fail. Although the ABA asserted, excuse me, although the ABA asserted that tough bar exams and accreditation were necessary for consumer protection, the cause for consumer protection came only when new minority lawyers were beginning to compete effectively with the ABA members. Manipulation of the bar exam and accreditation for economic purposes had an important racial component. The groups which threatened existing lawyers economically and which the lawyers therefore sought to exclude were racial and ethnic minorities. The first new approach that the bar employed was to decrease the pass rates on state bar exam. By the way, there are quotas. I mean, not quotas. Um, what is that called? Um, there's a bell curve that they, they only pass certain. So even if you do pass, they're not going to give you a license. They're only going to give licenses to so many people. And the same thing also happens in, in law school. Greta Van Susteren addressed this um, years ago that when she was a, a law professor, she received these memo, memos to um, give bell curves. So even if you earned an A, they were told to give C's and D's. So yeah, the whole thing is rigged. It's, it's supposed to make you, um, I don't know, it's supposed to make it more prestigious, make it like you're so hard, you're so tough. Um, it's, it's a whole... It's performative. It's um, it's not based on anything other than a facade that some elite people want to be smarter than others, so they um, deflate scores in order to, I don't know, justify what's going on and make people feel better, make people feel superior. I, it's just completely illegitimate. Okay, so where was I? Okay, the first new approach to the bar employee was to decrease the pass rate on state of bar exam. The reason that many state bar officials provided for decreasing the pass rate was to eliminate overcrowding in the profession, that is to reduce com competition for existing lawyers. So they were actually telling people, right, they were openly admitting that, um, they were trying to eliminate competition. Now they're lying. They're still doing the same thing, but now they're lying. They're trying to say that it's all about competency. By the way, um, there was this whole ordeal to, to make the legal profession an actual profession because it wasn't prestigious at, at all. Like I said originally, um, most attorneys were merchants. You could not earn a living as an attorney because it wasn't profitable. Um, it was the um, legitimate legitimization process that they made, um, which made the practice of law prestigious, right? The fact that you have to go through um, three years of undergrad and so four years of undergrad and three years in a law school, the fact you have to take a bar exam. I told you all about the psychology of it, that when you go into court, the judge's bench is raised. They um, choose the color of the robe to make, I mean, all these things are so psychological that basically um, you don't even question it. You just think these people are superior, that they put, you know, that they are they walk on water, they're smarter than you, you should just defer to them. Um, and by the way, most presidents, most governors, most mayors, most city council members, most senators, um, anybody who's anybody is going to be a, a lawyer, right? Um, Donald Trump one is one of the fair, I mean, few exceptions. Bush, um, Republican presidents are businessmen, but if you get a Democrat uh, president, they're going to be a, a lawyer. So we have a government of lawyers, not a government of men. But anyway, I, I've done so much research on this. I, I could just go on for days about this topic. Um, 
The second means that the bar exam used to reduce competition from new minority lawyers was to close law schools that serve minorities and to do this by imposing accreditation requirements that disfavored the schools. The new requirements prohibited for-profit schools requiring law schools, excuse me, law students to have expensive undergrad education eventually require expensive buildings and libraries and require more full-time faculty rather than a cheaper adjunct appointments. By the way, one of the reasons one of the um, reasons that law school is so expensive is not just the education itself, but it's because of the ABA's accreditation. They rank schools based on things like their research department, their law libraries, um, other programs, their uh, like who gets published and all that stuff. So all those things increase the cost of education and the tenure shift and all that stuff. So the ABA's accreditation process is keeping people out of the practice of law. It's the a the ABA has a stranglehold over the practice of law, and um, I'm not sure why anybody should be deferring to the ABA. Why doesn't anybody refer to the National Bar Association, which I also discussed with Judge Joe Brown, which is the national. I mean, it's the black version of the ABA, um, but it really has no political sway. The new requirements prohibited for, I already read that. The new requirements prohibited for profit schools required law students to have, I already read that part. More directly, the ABA eventually began to refuse to accredit law schools whose stu students had low scores on standardized tests and low undergraduate grades. Traditional law schools cooperated with the ABA's efforts because stricter accreditation promised to reduce competition from the new for profit schools. The words of bar officials and law school representatives make clear that a main reason for the new requirements was to purify the legal profession of minorities who were now competing with light, white lawyers. Establishing lawyers used racism to promote their economic interests in suppressing competition, invoking racist caricatures to attempt to justify suppression of the new minority competitors. The racist statements do not specify, do not specifically focus on blacks, but instead focus on Jews and other ethnic minorities. They were more, I mean, I would love to say that it was just about blacks, but they were more concern, concerned with Jews. Um, they were considered ambulance chasers, but, you know, blacks were also swept in with it. They didn't want blacks either. This does not mean that Blacks were despised any less than ethnic minorities, as the ABA's prohibition of Black members indicates. It suggests only that ethnic minority lawyers were a specific focus because, of, because there were none of them. The dean of the University of Chicago Law School wrote that a requirement of two years of college should be a rational, benefit, beneficent measure of reducing hereafter the spawning mass of promiscuous semi-intelligence which now enters the bar. The ABA officials said in the ABA report that many of the lawyers who came before the local bar grievance committee were Russian Jew boys. He recommended that a college education be required for all bar applicants so that immigrants could absorb American ideals. Another ABA leader again recommended that Applicants for the bar be required to attend college. This would require them to mix with the young American boys and girls. The dean of the Wisconsin Law School told the annual AALS meeting, if you enter the class roles of the night schools in our great cities, you will encounter a great large proportion of foreign names. Immigrants and sons of immigrants, remembering the respectable standing of the advocate in their home, covet the title of a badge of distinction. The result is a host of shrewd young men, imperfectly educated, cramped so they can pass the bar exams, all deeply impressed with the philosophy of getting on, but viewing the code of ethics with uncomprehending eyes. And it is the class of lawyers that causes grievance committees of bar association the most trouble. The term ambulance chaser appears to have been created around this time by the elite bar to describe the conduct of new lawyers by ambulance chasing 
elite lawyers usually meant vigorous competition in the legal market by foreign-born lawyers. One of the Pennsylvania bar said that Jewish applicants for the bar were without incalculable advantage of having been brought up in the American family life, and therefore they can hardly be taught the ethics of the profession as adequately as we desire. Likewise, Yale Law School was concerned about the Jewish problem. Is Dean argued against using applicants' grades to limit enrollment at law school? This would increase the number of students with foreign backgrounds rather than old American ancestry, producing an inferior student body ethically and socially. The ABA hoped to follow the lead of the medical profession. I told y'all, this, this isn't just the bar associate. All of these occupational licenses were created to keep people of color or minorities out which had recently succeeded in reducing the number of minority physicians. This all came about during the Great Depression. During the 1930s, they created these law, like I mean, these occupational um, statutes, which basically criminalized um, engaging in certain professions without a license. At the turn of the century, the number of medical schools had grown substantially. The American Association... The American Medical Association then issued a report that listed many of them as unacceptable. The Flexner Report and the accreditation push that followed led to the failure of many of the new medical schools. By 1920, the number of schools had fallen to half the number in 1900. One result was that the number of Black physicians declined. Fewer Blacks practiced medicine in 1950 than in 1900. An admiring leader in the ABA said, I do not know whether we can accomplish in the next few years working with the American Bar Association what the American Medical Association has accomplished for the medical profession and medical schools, but I think we can go a very long way. During the Depression, the ABA was able to convince the federal and state governments, governments to grant new law licenses. Excuse me. Let me read that over. During the Depression, the ABA was able to convince the federal and state governments to grant law licenses only to graduates of law school that the ABA accredited. In 1923, no state required graduation from law school at all, much less, much less from an ABA accredited school. By 1935, nine states required graduation from an ABA accredited school. By 1937, it was 20 states. By 1938, 23. Now almost all states require graduation from an ABA accredited law school and excluded graduates from unaccredited schools from practice in both state and federal courts. Federal courts in a state almost restrict admission to lawyers who have qualified for admission to a state score. By the way, when I um, graduated law school, my um, goal was to become a JAG officer, but there is no federal bar. So in order to become a JAG officer, I would have to be licensed through one of these states. So um, this is a serious problem. I also think that there should be an independent bar so-called licensed by the federal government that is independent of the state. I'm not sure why you have to go through the state. I'm not sure why, if I'm going to be practicing military law, why do I need to know oil and gas and property and uh, the tax code and family law and blah, blah, blah. Why do I need to know 30 plus subjects um, tested over a three-day course um, when I'm not going to be practicing in any of those areas. So it's, it's, just, it's designed to be um, unduly difficult just for the sake of being difficult. It's not supposed to measure your competency. It, it should, it's not, a, and I asked on this when I had my lawsuit, is it based on minimal competency or is it based on a high, like what is the standard of competency? And they basically dismissed the case without giving me any discovery because I wanted answers to those questions. Um, and even the um, the attorney, the, the attorney for the state, she basically um, claimed, by the way, 
uh, qualified immunity doesn't only protect um, monetary damages. It also protects um, the, them from the lawsuit itself. So what she put in her answers for my interrogatory is that she claimed qualified immunity to answer those questions. It, it's just so absurd. They're just so above the law. They don't have to be held accountable for anything. Okay, where was I? The bar, the AB, when I say the bar, they're talking about the ABA. The bar also succeeded in convincing states to require substantial education before law school. So you have to get an undergrad degree before you can even go to law school. In 1927, only three, only one state required two years of college. After 1929, state after state began to require two years of college. By 1942, nearly all states require at least two years of college, although until 1950, because of lawyers educated under the earlier system more than half of practicing lawyers had not attended college at all now aba accreditation standards 305 and 502 require at least three years of undergrad education and three years of law school during the depression the aba happily noted that the new requirement of two years of college was causing both a drop in the number of law students and the cost in closing of non-elite law schools. As during the Jacksonian period of populism, not 100 years before, many argued that the requirements were elitist. They unfairly excluded those who could not gain admission to an elite school, who lacked sufficient wealth to support themselves during the many years of required college and law school study. One scholar noted that the proposition is undemocratic and tends to create a law school of favorite of a favorite class or a professional aristocracy to consist alone of those who had the good luck to be born well off financially or who have rich friends who will let them have the means to take up these long years in school the aba's campaign of racist self-interest in the 1930s succeeded the bar's manipulation of both the bar exam and accreditation reduced substantially the entry into the profession of Blacks and other minorities. At the point when new civil rights victories had begun to promise to open the profession to Blacks, the ABA used the bar exam and accreditation to ensure that the door remained shut. The door would not reopen even a sliver for 30 years. Accreditation began, excuse me, a, a, accreditation helped to ensure that fewer Blacks entered the legal profession than under the earlier overt, overt discrimination, like the AMA, a medical, American Medical Association. Before it, the American Bar Association used accreditation to exclude Blacks just as effectively as earlier generations had used direct racial discrimination. Only in 1970, after affirmative action began, did the proportion of Black lawyers again achieve its level of 1940. Was there more? No, that's, that's it. Um, but that's not even getting into the history. There's, um, like I said, all standardized tests are supposed to have indicia of content validity and criterion reliability. There have been multiple studies. Well, actually, there's only California. California is the only one that does psychometric tests on bar exams. And the last one I saw was was less than 40%. I believe it was 39%. Um, I haven't looked at it recently. Um, but in order for a standardized test to be valid, it has to have at least 70% content validity and criterion reliability, most states don't even have psychometric um, assessments made at all. A psychometric assessment means that you're supposed to have experts interview practicing attorneys. They're supposed to go out into the field and actually assess the skills that they are using in the practice of law. And then those skills are supposed to be tested on the bar exam or any um, occupational exam. Um, they don't do this. They just make the exam 
unreasonably difficult just for the sake of being difficult. It's like a hazing ritual. It's based on rote memorization. There's no deliberation. You don't have time. Um, you're supposed to just take a bunch of multiple choice practical uh, practice questions and then without even reading the question, just recognize a fact pattern, move, like answer the question, move on to the next one. The same thing with the essay questions. You see a fact pattern, you practice so many practice essays that you um, know exactly what to say. It's a bullet point thing where you say, boom, boom, boom. If I say this, I get points for this. If I say this, I get points for that. You don't, it's all opinion based. It's not valid. It, it's not anything. It's difficult just for the sake of being difficult. But at the roots of it, it was designed to keep people of color out of the practice of law. Um, I've been saying this for years. Nobody's been listening to me. I've done everything in my power to try to fight for it. But at the end of the day, the only people who are in a position to do anything about it are going to be practicing attorneys, and they don't want the competition themselves, even black attorneys. They don't give a shit. I went to black attorneys. They told me, why should I care? I already have my license. Um, so for an outsider, a lay person is not going to care because it doesn't affect them, except for the fact that when you want uh, representation by an attorney, you're going to have to pay them $500 an hour because there is no competition and they have artificially created a scarcity for legal services. So the public is screwed and it is a hindrance to effective democracy. People don't have fair trials. I'm going to be addressing um, why I think um, there should be appointed attorneys in misdemeanor cases as, a, as well as felony cases. But the whole system is completely rigged. But it really starts with um, the, I don't know, the barriers to entry when it comes to practice of law. Because we do have a society of lawyers that govern everything in our lives. The government is run by lawyers. Anyone who has any type of power is going to be a lawyer. And so if you're screening people and keeping them out, then basically you're just ensuring that you're basically ensuring a system of white supremacy is what you're doing. Um, there's a reason why the system is the way it is, because it, it's, it all starts with the damn bar exam in, in law schools, that if you don't become an attorney, you're basically nobody and you're just, you're just going to be subjugated and told what to do. So yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they're starting to make a change in the right direction. But the problem is that it's, it's too late for people like me some of us have been, there have been people who have been destroyed, and I'm I'm one of them, um, completely brought the financial ruin, and nobody was there to um, help us take take on this fight. Again, the only reason they're doing this now is because of COVID, that there was a shortage of attorneys, and it's, there always have been shortage of attorneys in rural areas. Um, uh, South Dakota, I believe it was, had a shortage of attorneys. And I wrote the Supreme Court requesting that they change their admissions requirements. And yeah, they just refuse to do it. The Bar Association has a death grip over the practice of law, and they don't really want to open up the floodgates so that um, average, everyday people can practice law. So I don't even know why they even let people into law school, and they know good and damn well that some of us are not going to be able to practice law ever. We're just going to be screwed in a perpetual uh, career purgatory and we're bait. I, I don't know. Like we're just roadkill. They're just going to step over us and pretend we don't exist. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that it's finally happening. I hope that it, I think it's going to eventually trickle down to more and more States as they realize that the bar exam was never a valid measurement of competency in the first place. It's just too late for me, and I'm very bitter about it because my I, I fought for so long and nobody believed me. And it's um even black attorneys didn't believe me. I, I don't understand why you would think that I'm making this stuff up. I, I was very disappointed with Judge John Brown because I when I called in, I had all this data and I wanted to actually have a real conversation, and he just kind of um forced me to have an or on the spot debate with him. Didn't really allow me to get two words in edgewise. He just basically wanted to lecture me 
on white supremacist talking points because he got his who cares what happens to you? Why are you parroting the system's talking points? I'm trying to, you know, because you don't want to change anything. You don't want to actually get your hands dirty. You just want to have it easy and just lecture me. You can you can lecture me, but you're not going to lecture the system. You're not going to use your political clout, right, and your social capital to actually help somebody because you're not interested in helping the black community. You just want to lecture people and tell people to pull their pants up like some Bill Cosby bullshit. So um, I feel vindicated, but at the same time, I'm still relegated to working a shitty job. So my life is completely meaningless. I'm never going to be able to self-actualize and do what I worked so hard to be able to do. But um, I don't know. I mean, I have a house now. I'm pretty much stuck in a state for for a while. I don't know that it could. I think that I'm probably already barred because of my activism that because I I fought so long and hard against it. I've made a lot of enemies. And if they were to do a competency and fitness, or a character and fitness assessment, I probably would, even if I could meet those other requirements, my character, character and fitness um, assessment would probably fail all because I was put in that position in the first place. So yeah, I think it's too late for me. I think I'm, I'm screwed. So good luck to everyone else. I'm glad that this finally happened for you. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and end this video.